Welcome to Easter Sunday worship service at Living Savior Lutheran Church in Asheville and Hendersonville, North Carolina. My name is Paul Zell. Pastor Caleb Kerbis and I, the other pastor here at Living Savior, are pleased to bring you the Word of God as you join us in hearing it, reading it, singing it, praying in response to it. In other words, as you actively worship with us. The worship service, is, as found in this recording, will guide you with the words. There's also uh, the worship service laid out below this particular video link. May the Lord bless your Easter Sunday worship wherever you are and help you to understand that because Christ is risen, every needed blessing, every needed blessing is ours for now and for eternity. The Invocation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Confession of our sins and absolution. Upon the hill, the cross now stands empty. Morning light breaks upon the tomb. As we come before our God, humbled by our Savior's sacrifice, let us confess our sins. Heavenly Father, I humbly come before you. I confess that I am sinful in thought, word, and deed. Father, I am sorry for my sins, yet I believe that for the sake of my Lord Jesus Christ, you will have mercy on me. Upon this, your sincere confession, and by Christ's command and authority, I assure you that all your sins are forgiven. The vacant cross and the empty grave are God's signs to you that he has accepted the sacrifice of his one and only Son. Whoever believes this simple truth of Scripture has eternal life. The Lord is gracious and righteous. When I was in great need, he saved me. I will not die, but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let us pray. 
Almighty God, by the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, you conquered death and opened the gate to eternal life. Grant that we who have been raised with him through baptism may walk in newness of life and ever rejoice in the hope of sharing his glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be dominion and praise now and forever. Amen. The Gospel of the Day for the Festival of the Resurrection of Our Lord from St. Matthew, chapter 28. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Late Friday afternoon, they had been sitting and watching Joseph of Arimathea had gone into the city. He had secured permission from the governor to take the body down from the cross. Now the women were sitting and watching opposite the tomb as Joseph and his, assi his assistant Nicodemus came rushing past, carrying with them spices and linens. They were going to wrap the body and prepare it for burial. The bruised beaten, pierced, dead body. Meanwhile, the sun was going down in the west. They were hurrying because the next day, which was going to begin at sundown, the next day was the Jewish Sabbath, and all of them had to be back to those households where they were staying during the Passover festival. So quickly, very quickly, they finished their task, laid the body on the stone slab, stepped out of the tomb, rolled the big stone into the entrance of the tomb, and walked away. Scripture tells us that there were as many as five minutes, excuse me, five women observing this, sitting and watching. St. Matthew identifies two of them by name, each with the common name Mary. As we could imagine it, after that tearful Friday night, after a melancholy Saturday Sabbath, after a restless Saturday night, at the first glimmer of daylight on Sunday morning, the, the women met at the, the prearranged place. As they walked together toward the tomb, can you imagine their fearful hopes that earthquake that we just felt was awful 
one of them says. I hope the aftershocks aren't as bad. That big stone that our two friends rolled before the entrance, another says. I hope somebody's there to help us roll it away. I'm sure we'll have time to continue to, to, to finish the preparations of the body for burial. But I'm afraid when I see that body again, I might collapse. Everything that I saw on that Friday, his agony, his crying out to the Heavenly Father, all that mockery. I don't know if I'm ever going to forget what that felt like, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm afraid I'm never going to understand why it occurred. I'd put my hope in him. But now I'm afraid he's not who I thought he was. Then they arrive at the tomb. They arrive at the tomb, and their hopes become much larger even as their fears diminish. You see, there's this angel of the Lord. The very angel who arrived at the tomb with the earthquake, the one who rolled away the stone and sat on it, the angel who scared the, the guards half to death, the one whose appearance was like a flash of lightning and whose clothes was as white as, the snow, as snow, that angel immediately tells the women what has happened. For, but he begins with this. He says, do not be afraid. And he means it. Do not be afraid, he says. I know you're looking for Jesus who is crucified. He, he, he's not here. He's risen, just as he said. Sure, you can take a look where, where they laid his body on Friday, but you're not going to find him. So once you've looked, go quickly and tell his disciples. Tell them that he's going to Galilee where he will see them there. Tell them that an angel of the Lord said this. St. Matthew tells us that the, the women rushed away just about bursting with joy and yet also fearful, afraid that, that maybe what they had heard wasn't real, that maybe this particular hope wasn't going to last either. And who can blame them? Just two days earlier, they had, they had watched him die. And just a couple hours after that, they had watched the body, the dead body, laid in the tomb. But now as they walk away from the angel, suddenly Jesus is standing before them. Greetings, he says. There's this, this worshipful, reverential, joyful moment as they, as, they, as they clasp him, as they hug him. And then he too tells them, do not be afraid, do not be afraid. Just go tell the disciples that I will see them soon. I hope, but I'm afraid. I've been saying that all my life, or at least thinking it, and I know you have too. I hope our team, our, our team wins the big game, but I'm, I'm afraid the other team is too good. I hope I get into that college I want to get into, but I'm afraid if I don't, I, I'm not going to get the job that I want. I'm, I'm afraid I, I someday meet that special someone because I'm afraid to spend the rest of my life all alone. I hope that all of this social distancing and stay-at-home requirement, I, I, I hope that it, it saves lives, but I'm afraid it's going to do a lot of damage. I hope that that illness does not come into my household. Because I'm afraid if it does, it could cost someone their life. I hope that someday, someday, I can return to the work I like and to the routines I appreciate and to the, 
to the people I love to be with, to actually be with, but I'm afraid it's, it's going to be a long, long time before that happens. I hope, but I'm afraid. Even, even a three-year-old understands that. Even a three-year-old knows that certain things hope for, they, they come true, they happen, but many, many, many of them don't, don't happen. Hopes are not always rewarded. Which is what makes this day, this Easter Sunday, this festival of the resurrection of our Lord, this truth that Christ is risen, this is what makes this day, this truth, this celebration so extraordinary, so glorious. Today, all of us hope that God will be our shield and fortress in all of our troubles, even in the the troubles that are, are so fearsome nowadays. He will be our shield and our fortress. And there's no afraid in that hope because Christ is risen. Today, all of us hope that our Heavenly Father will provide each of his children with what they need. Not necessarily with what each of us wants, but with, each, with what we, each of us needs. And there's no afraid in that hope, because Christ is risen. Today we can hope that our holy God will not hold our foolish worries and our faithless doubts against us. We can hope that our holy God will be merciful and forgive those and all of our sins. And there's no afraid in that hope because Christ, who died for our sins, is risen. Today, all of us hope that God will fulfill every promise he has made including this one, that on the last day he will raise all the dead and he will take us and all who have been brought to faith in Jesus, take us to a heavenly life where there are no more worries, no more fears, no more sorrows, no more separations from him or from one another. And there's no afraid in that hope, because Christ is risen. I hope, but I'm afraid. Yeah, there are some things sometimes where I'm still going to need to say that, and you will too, because God has not guaranteed everything that, that we human beings hope for, and yet, with what really matters, there's no afraid whatsoever. And you know exactly why. So do I. It's because Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Alleluia.
The epistle lesson from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins." then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. The word of the Lord. Dear friends in Christ, have you been able to put your finger on the intersection of all of the feelings and fears that you have been having the past few weeks? From the discomfort of this new normal to the fears of the future, the pain of the present, the uncertainty about the economy, the decrease in your own finances, and the increase of a whole lot of the other fears around us. There was a group of colleagues at Harvard Business Review, and one of them apparently said to the other in their Zoom meeting, I think I'm feeling grief, and the others nodded. And so they decided to do an interview recently, and maybe you saw this widely shared article an interview of David Kessler, who's kind of the who's who when it comes to talking about grief and the, the stages that he's well known for. He teamed up with Elizabeth Keebler Ross to write a couple books, and now there's actually six stages. And so throughout this interview, one of the things that they made very clear is that if you're able to name it and proceed through, that is the way that you get through this difficult reality that we are living in. So. So is that it for you? One might define grief this way, that there are a bunch of difficult circumstances, maybe even tragic, that press down upon you and you are incapable of changing your own reality, getting your way out of this new negative experience that bears down upon you. Is that how you would classify it for yourself? I think many would when you, when you look around and you, you see where we're at and where we're headed and there doesn't really seem to be an end in sight, at least not a clear one that takes us back to where we were. And of all the things that you might want to say to yourself, all the things that you might want to put your finger on, all the ways you might want to classify it, of all the things you might want to hear or say, the one thing that I know that you don't want to hear is anybody, much less me, telling you that it's all going to be okay. The reason you are here today, right here, right now, is not because you came to hear somebody give you some fluffy, optimistic pep talk. Somebody who's going to tell you that if you do this and that and add it to these five steps, then your new normal is going to be a better version of your better self, and it's going to really work out. And the reason is because you and I know, and we've been living this long enough, even though it's only been a few weeks, that we're not going to be satisfied with somebody just telling us that it's going to be okay. Because all of that rests on words like if, and maybe, and hopefully, and fingers crossed. And we even know that early on when people said, well, it's going to be okay, it's, it's going to be okay, there was a lot of pushback when, when certain powerful voices were saying such things. We're not okay with that. And maybe I... I'm a little presumptuous, but you didn't come here today to hear that. If you're sitting where you are sitting right now, are still tuning in, having heard everything that Pastor Zell just shared about the gospel of Matthew, the fear of the women, and you are still here, 
to share in these gospel truths with us based on the resurrection. You did not come here to listen to somebody, least of which me, tell you that you need to raise yourself, so to speak, into this new life or new version, metaphorically speaking, your own kind of resurrection from some type of proverbial grave. Please. And I don't mean to be frank. I'm all for encouragement and building one another up. But that's not why we are here today to build our hope on on just naming it and claiming it and proceeding through as though that's going to get much better. Is it grief? Is it fear? Is it worry? Is it all of those things? Is it something else? No matter what it is, the Apostle Paul in the lesson invites us to engage in what this reality is. He says towards the end of that paragraph that I just read from 1 Corinthians 15, if all that we have to hope for is this life, I mean, that's really kind of the first part of it. If all that we have to hope for in this life then is this life, then what do we really have? I mean, let's say, just for argument's sake, that you and I get through all of this healthier, maybe even wealthier, and stronger because of it. But really, all of our hope and all of our fears are based on just getting through it. And let's say we got there, but all our hope is based on and rooted in this life. What's the difference between us who have our hope in this life and somebody else who's terrified and also only has their hope in this life, and they tragically die because of the coronavirus. What is the difference between any and everyone who only has their hope in this life, this broken reality? There is no difference. Because one thing is for sure. No matter if the person is looking to themselves, to a greater group of people to provide some vaccine or some solution, to this world to somehow get better, there's one commonality with all of those problematic perspectives. They all have a timestamp. They all end up in death. Our lesson made that clear too. You look at all of our ancestors before us. What happened? They they, they all died. So clearly there is no answer in and of ourselves. And, And Paul is really inviting us to perceive that reality that we're in. If all that we have to hope for is this life, but, but he doesn't just say that. He says, if all that we have to hope for in, in this life is Christ, with the assumption, so to speak, for argument's sake, that he's dead, then, then we're to be pitied. We are more miserable than all people on planet Earth. Because we're wasting our time even just now, and the investments of our time and our energy and our, and our offerings, for what? That that there's a dead Jesus behind a closed tomb somewhere? If God didn't raise his son, then Jesus isn't raised? Then what do we have? Paul gets theological, but it's still quite practical. What is the answer to sin and guilt? If in the end I still die, when my conscience is very clear and when I'm honest with myself about the shortcomings of who I am as as a pastor, as a husband, as a father, as a friend, and all the other hats that I wear, When you are honest with yourself about your shortcomings, what is the solution to that? To to just name it, identify it, and proceed through? That kind of ends with a maybe, an if, and, and hopefully. What is the solution if... In this life, all we have to hope for is, is just something better, but then it ends in death, then, then, then what? Because there's no answer to that. So if our hope is in Christ and he is still dead, then what do we have? We're left with this reality and an attempt to try and fix it ourselves with no solution in sight. And the last thing you want me to tell you is that it's all going to get better because you know the reality. And the last thing you want to tell me right after that is that we can somehow get beyond this and it's all going to turn out okay in the end eternally. Because that type of hope is a nebulous hope. It's a cross your fingers and have a rabbit's foot in your pocket kind of a hope. But that is not the kind of hope that we have at Easter. At Easter, God points our eyes not just to some intuition or or to some feeling, not to just some change in perspective, not to just some opinion given by some religious religious pundits. He, He points us to an empty tomb. And Jesus is nowhere to be found. He points to historical facts that Jesus was most certainly raised from the dead. Even before our lesson, Paul says he appeared over the period of 40 days to over 500 people. 
And at that time, Paul says, you can go ask them. Many of them are still alive. He's inviting scrutiny. Go, go and ask them. Why would they say that he's alive? Do they want to die a martyr's death for nothing? He must really be alive. And there's further proof in our lesson as, as Paul is saying, what are we really left with if Christ is really dead? Think this through. What is the reality? Are we left with just some pep talk, some optimistic speech, and a cross our fingers and hope we don't die? <laughs> no, our hope that is the hope of Easter, is on this rock-solid truth that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, and we can even shout hallelujah because God who put all our sins on him and punished him on the cross gave us the answer to our sins, and to prove that God accepted his payment, he raised him from the dead. So Jesus walking out of that tomb and leaving it empty means that our hearts are anything but empty. Rather, they are full of forgiveness, full of peace with God, and hope that rests in eternal truths. What else do you and I have? We don't just have this perspective where we, where we identify it and proceed through. That, that's kind of where they ended up at the end. If, whether you're, you're denying it or you finally get to one of those latter stages of accepting it and understanding it and being in the present, once you can do that and then you proceed through, that's the trick. How far does that get us in the end? That's like saying, I have my hope in something, but it doesn't last and last. It ends up in death. That's like looking at our lives and viewing them as purposeless instead of having an intention imbued by God himself. But the hope of Easter, dear friends, remains and so that means that you and I don't end up in some grave, and that's it. Instead, because our sins are forgiven through the bloodstained cross and the empty tomb, because we are at peace with God who raised his son, who washed us of our sins, erased our guilt, and gave us eternal life, because we are made children of the eternal king of heaven, then our hope is anything but just some kind of optimistic pep talk. It's everything. It's the way that we live our lives. It causes us to lift up our eyes to the skies. We long for that day when what we even sing now becomes realized. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. For I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. If Christ is dead, then not only do we have no hope at all, we have maybe some self-talk, but really nothing in the, hand, in the end, but we're to be pitied more than all, but but Christ has indeed been raised, and that is just the beginning. He uses the word first fruits. He is the first, and we follow in his likeness, not to end up in some grave, but to walk out of it. Death is but a doorway into the eternal presence of God, where the peace that he has promised is not just something that we have by faith, but it is realized in sight as our eternal existence. That's what heaven is, and that's yours through Christ. All the sins that were brought into this world through Adam were washed away by that second, greater Adam, Jesus Christ. And because that is our hope, then we don't walk around using words like maybe, and hopefully, in that sense. And if, instead, we use terms like this, indeed. Christ has indeed been raised, and so will I. We use terms like this, fact. My forgiveness before God is a fact and therefore I have nothing to worry about. Even as we face these unprecedented times and the fears seem to increase with the next news report every single day and every single week, we can face the future without fear because we are not left to this life. We are not left to our own demise and we are not left to what any of the pundits in this world would try to predict. We are left into the hands of a God who gave his son so that we would be his daughters and sons. And since that is a fact, then this hope of Easter doesn't just end today. 
Because Jesus didn't go back into that tomb, this hope of Easter remains. It continues tomorrow and the next day. It affects the way we view whatever we see and hear on the TV or on our phones. It affects the way that we view the people around us who also need this gospel truth that lasts and lasts. It affects the way we even view ourselves. We're not allowing this world to determine who we are or not even ourselves when we tell ourselves the worst things about ourselves. No, because we have been forgiven and God has given us this eternal security that Christ has indeed been raised. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And therefore, my friends, we can shout hallelujah because this hope of Easter is true today and it will be tomorrow because it remains. May God grant us such faith that continues to face down fear with this hope. In Jesus' name, amen. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, God of grace, you have brought us into a new and living hope by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. We marvel at the love you showed by your willingness to sacrifice your son to pay for our sins. We praise you for sending the true life and light into the world. Lord Jesus, King of grace, you have filled our hearts with resurrection joy by your victory over sin, death, and the grave. You have conquered the darkness and given us comfort and hope. Hear us now, Lord, as we bring you our private prayers. Dear Savior, we who are weary and burdened come to you for rest, knowing that because of your perfect redemption there is no condemnation for us. Take away our doubts and fears, and renew in us each day the joy of our salvation. Amen. Heavenly Father, hear our prayers for the sake of him who is the firstborn of the dead and is now alive forever, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. It is in his name that we bring the prayer he taught his first disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may the glorious Father who by his power raised our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, give you the spirit of wisdom to know the hope to which he has called you. And may he preserve you in body, soul, and spirit until your own resurrection on the day of Christ Jesus. Let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Fiercest drought and storm.
Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on the cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin. Precious blood. 